Assalamu alaikum to you all and welcome to another episode of Islamic Lessons Made Easy. In today's episode, we will be discussing many different topics which I hope you will thoroughly enjoy and benefit from. We will now continue with the learning of our Arabic alphabet. The letter we will talk about today is the letter Ra, which is the 10th letter of the Arabic alphabet. Let us watch this next video to learn more about this letter. This letter is called Ra. Ra is pronounced with a thick sound if there is a fatha or a dhamma on it. But it is pronounced light if there is a kasra on it. There are also other rules which will be explained in future lessons. Ra is sort of like the English letter R, but with a bit of a roll of the tongue. For example, the R in rolling or the word raw are similar but not exact. This is what Ra looks like at the beginning, like this in the middle and like this at the end of a word. Here are some examples. Ra in the word Rumman, which means pomegranate. Or Ra in the word Rommel, which means sand. Ra is also one of the letters which no letter can join after it, as shown in the examples. Have you ever wondered where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is? Is he on the mountains or beneath the seas? Does he live in the forests or is he up in the sky? Can he be confined to one place or can he be at all places at the same time? Let us watch the next video to learn more about this important concept. When I was younger, I used to believe that Allah lives in a house in the sky and I could go and see him by climbing up a long ladder. But now, I know that Allah does not live in the sky. Allah is everywhere. Allah is even with the moon and the stars and he is everywhere on the earth. Wherever you go, Allah is there. You can never hide from Allah. Even at the bottom of the sea, with the fish, Allah is there too. Allah is also at the top of every mountain and in every valley and forest. Just like the air you breathe in, Allah is everywhere. Allah is not just in the mosque. He is also in the city, at home, at school, in the office and all the farms. He is everywhere. Everything you see around you in nature was made by Allah. Allah makes all the beautiful flowers, all the birds and fish. Allah even made you and me. If you could go in a spaceship to another planet, Allah is there as well. Even right now when you are watching this video, Allah is with you. He is your best friend. When you are good, you make Allah happy and he loves you even more. We all know that we can purify ourselves and all the impurities and najasa around us with water. However, did you know that there are other ways of making impurities tahir and clean too? Can you take a guess what these things might be? Well, let's look at this next video and see if you are correct. Apart from water, there are other ways of purifying something that has become mutanajis. Earth is one of those purifiers. Earth means soil, sand, stone, brick or something similar. Earth can purify the bottom of your shoes provided the floor is tahir and dry. The najasa came off by walking and the najasa came from the earth itself. For example, you were walking and stepped on feces that was already on the earth. The bottom of your shoe is najis. You walk or wipe it on the soil or sand until the najasa goes away. Now the bottom of your shoe is tahir. 
But if the Najasa came onto the shoe that wasn't already on earth, for example, you were bleeding and it landed on the bottom of the shoe, the earth cannot make it tahir. Note, walking on a carpet, rug or grass, the shoe will not become tahir. Also, earth does not purify other parts of our body or clothes. The sun can purify the earth, buildings and walls provided that they are wet and the najasa is gone and nothing prevents the sun from shining on it. Transformation is also another purifier, meaning that its essence transformed into something totally different. For example, a dog dies and it decomposes into ash, the ash is tired. But if the essence of the najis thing did not transform, it is still najis. For example, if wheat became najis and you turned it to flour or bread, it is still najis. Change or chemical transformation is another purifier, specifically for wine into vinegar. This is where its properties have changed. For example, wine is left open and it turns to vinegar after some time. The vinegar is tahir. Transfer of najasa from a najis place to a non-najis place becomes tahir. For example, human blood is najis, but the blood of a mosquito is considered tahir. So if the mosquito drinks some of the human's blood, the blood becomes part of the mosquito and is considered tahir. The next purifier is called association. So when a najis thing becomes tahir, the thing associated with it becomes tahir too. For example, when one turns into vinegar, it is considered tahir. So does the container associated with it. Or you are washing a najis shirt. When the shirt becomes tahir, your hands associated with it become tahir too. The blood that remains inside the body of an animal that is permissible to eat and was slaughtered according to Islamic law is tahir. Note, this does not mean you can consume the blood, it just means it is tahir. If the inner parts of your nose, ears or mouth become najis, they become tahir once the najasa goes away and there is no need to wash them with water, as long as the blood does not come out. This is only specific for those areas of the body. The Holy Quran was sent down to our Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam as a blessing and guidance for us all. It is such a miraculous book that it is never outdated and benefits people of all backgrounds, civilizations and eras. Its words have a richness that is profound and an incredible depth in their meaning. Sometimes its meanings are apparent and sometimes hidden. It is so important for us to ponder over its holy words and learn the depths of their meaning so we can implement its true teaching into our lives. Studying the meaning of the Holy Quran is known as Tafsir. In the following video, we will be learning about the Tafsir of Surah Al Ma'un, which is Surah number 107 of the Holy Quran. Let us watch this video and learn about this Surah. Surah Al Ma'un. Some say that this Surah was revealed about a person called Abu Sufyan who was one of the biggest enemies of the Prophet Muhammad at his time. So Surah Al-Ma'un starts off with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Ara'ayta alladhi yukadhibu biddin Have you seen the one who caused the judgment day a lie? The word deen sometimes means religion but in this ayah it means the day of judgment. And we said the day of judgment is a day where all humans will be gathered together in front of Allah and all our actions and beliefs will be judged, rewarded or punished for. So who is the one that caused the judgment day a lie? The next verse explains فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُوا الْيَتِيمِ The one who treats the orphans really bad and really harsh. Imagine a person who has no parents and is treated really bad, yelled at and pushed around. 
No one would like that. The next verse says, وَلَا يَحُدُّ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ and never encourages others to feed the poor and the needy. If you see a poor person and you don't have any money or food to give them, you would at least tell others to help the poor person. But these people don't just push around the orphans, they never tell others to help the poor. These people who don't believe in the Day of Judgment don't care about good deeds or rewards and punishment. That's why Allah says in the next verse, what a misfortune for those that pray. And then the next verse says, Those who are careless in their prayers. These same people don't care about the time of prayer. They don't care about the conditions either. Anybody can make a mistake in prayer. But these people don't take the prayer seriously at all. They keep forgetting about their prayer and even leave out the prayer completely. So Allah says, What a misfortune for those that pray. The next verse says, hum yura'oon. Those who do things only to be seen by others. So for example, they will only pray in front of others to show off, or they will only pay some money to the poor in front of others to look good but they will never help or pray when no one is looking. The next verse says, And they don't even help out in the smallest things. The word ma'un means a small thing, which is not worth much money, that neighbors usually take from each other, like some salt, matches, a cup, and so on. If your neighbor came knocking on your door asking for some salt, you would at least give them some if you had it. But these people won't even give a small amount of anything. So from the start of this surah, it talks about some bad qualities, treating orphans badly, not telling others to help the poor, being careless in prayer, showing off, and not even giving the smallest things to your neighbors. All these bad qualities are because they rejected the day of judgment. The Day of Judgment is one of the main usul al-deen. Every Muslim must believe in them. If you don't believe in any of them, you will not be considered a Muslim. The person that rejects the Day of Judgment doesn't care about reward and punishment. That's why it's easy for them to have these qualities. So this surah is teaching us that we should treat the orphans kindly. If we can't afford to help the poor, we should encourage others to help the poor. We should take our prayer seriously for the sake of Allah only, not to show off. We should be kind to our neighbors and give them even the smallest things if they need it. If we do these things sincerely for the sake of Allah, we can truly say we believe in a day of judgment. And hopefully we will see our rewards on this day, inshaAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described himself in the Holy Quran through his majestic names and attributes. In order to understand Tawheed clearly, it is important for us to study Allah's attributes. The attributes of Allah have been divided into two categories. Let us watch this video to understand this better. So far we have proved logically that there must be a necessary existence which began everything else and we have also distinguished it from its creation. There are attributes which are positive attributes which are true and some are negating attributes which are not true for a necessary existence. So far we have proven some of the attributes of this necessary existence such as it is independent and the first cause. It also has no beginning and no end and is eternal. We have proven that it cannot be made up of physical parts. It cannot have a body. It also cannot be bound by time and space. It also cannot have intellectual parts or an intellectual definition. So what does that mean? It means we can negate and destroy the definition in our minds. For example, we say H2O as in water. If I take out the O, oxygen, in my mind, we won't have water anymore. I would have destroyed that definition. 
An intellectual definition can only be given to something that is made up of parts. The books of philosophy and the books of theology describe the attributes of this necessary being using two particular headings. First is the attributes of essence and then the second is the attributes of action. Most important attributes of essence are life, power and knowledge. But how do we prove this? The simple proof is that when these attributes are used for any creation, they refer to their perfections. For example, if a necessary existent does not have life, therefore it cannot give life. If a necessary existent does not have power, then it cannot give power. But as we see in creation there is life, power and knowledge, then it becomes necessary that this necessary existent must have these positive attributes in a superior and perfect form that never diminishes. This necessary being is distinguished from all of its creation and we name him Allah, which means the being who comprises all the attributes of perfection. We always pray to Allah to give us success in this world and the hereafter. There is nothing wrong with achieving success in this world. However, we should all understand that true success is not measured by how much wealth we have accumulated or how famous we are but it is measured by the degree of our God consciousness or taqwa that we have in us and how well we abide by Allah's laws in this world to attain his pleasure. There are certain actions which if we perform will ensure this true success. Let us look at this next video to find out more. Here are some important factors and key lessons of life. First, the importance of practice. Acquiring religious knowledge is easy. Being interested in spirituality, tafsir and etc is easy. But what is difficult is putting it into practice. Instead of practicing what they already know, most people are in search of more knowledge in the hope that they will somehow miraculously help them evolve further. So they attend more classes, more seminars, more lectures. Without knowledge we remain ignorant and don't know how to evolve but acquiring it and not practicing it blocks us from acquiring more real knowledge and in fact hardens our hearts. It is therefore the difficult matters such as fasting, worshipping, reflecting, working with the poor and etc that is required to change the theory we learn into real knowledge. Imam Sadiq said the first people to enter paradise will be those who performed acts of common courtesy to others. Another lesson is the importance of being connected to the community. A lot of youth feel pressured to help out in their community and withdraw when they have exams or start university. From a youth perspective, however, the community can be a lifesaver literally, especially when they start university. When you are attached to and involved in your local community, it acts as a shield that protects you from being confused, lost, depressed, lonely, losing your faith and etc. To stop coming to the mosque or centers because you now go to university is a fatal mistake. It is when you start university that you should and you need to be part of the Muslim community the most. The Prophet peace be upon him said, The best of my community are those who spend away their youth in Allah's obedience. Then there is the importance of learning by teaching. It would be nice to have a teacher all our lives or someone who can always be there to help answer all our questions. But at some point we need to become our own teacher. Nothing will give you the discipline of constant learning like being a teacher. The Prophet peace be upon him said the best form of charity is that a person should gain knowledge and then teach it. Life only gets busier until you retire. A lot of people assume they will contribute to the society and the community or attain their noble and religious goals after they finish university or this and that. As we grow older life only gets busier and our commitments multiply. We only find time when we retire at which point 
we don't have the energy to make a difference. The Holy Prophet peace be upon him said, learning something during one's youth is like engraving in stone, and learning something when one is old is like writing on the surface of water. Also, don't be ashamed of learning. Asking regardless of your age or your circumstances is a good thing and can be really beneficial. The Prophet peace be upon him said, my nation's expiry occurs when they disdain knowledge. The major decisions you will make in life such as choosing the right career, spouse and religious devotion and practice are also key lessons of life. Imam Ali salam said, success is an aid for the intellect and failure is an aid for ignorance. Another lesson is the importance of giving back to society. The youth will often complain that their parents treat them like kids. The reason parents do that is because they don't see a sense of responsibility in you. A sense of responsibility is shown when you can do what normal adults do without being told what to do. For example, when you don't have to be reminded to clean your room or to take out the garbage, when you don't spend all your free time playing computer games, chatting with friends, surfing the internet. As soon as you learn to show the concerns that an adult does and you take on the responsibility of tasks at home without being told, it may be running the washing machine, picking up things lying around, going out to get the grocery and etc. You begin to evolve into an adult. To put it differently, a child is very needy from birth. They assume their parents have to serve them and provide for them food, clothes, shelter, time and make their entire lives rotate around theirs. It never occurs to them to thank their parents or appreciate their sacrifices, except perhaps on special occasions. Your parents will only see you as an adult when you move from being entirely selfish to being selfless. Imam al-Sadiq said, Beware of becoming lazy and bored for they will forbid you from your share in this world and the hereafter. There is also the importance of memorizing the Quran, Hadith and Dua, which is not just for spiritual rewards. Often in life, when you are faced with challenges or severe difficulties, you will only find solace from this and from your faith. If you know much of this by heart, you will be surprised how the appropriate passages will come to you naturally to guide you in how you react to your situations. The Holy Prophet peace be upon him said, the Quran is rich and there is no richness without it and no poverty after it. We have now reached the end of this episode. We hope you enjoyed this session and found it beneficial. Please don't forget to join us next week at the same time for another interesting episode of Islamic Lessons Made Easy. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.